Good afternoon, dear friends. Greetings in the wonderful name of the one who saved us, the Lord Jesus. And I've already been notified if I fail to pray in Hebrew, somebody's going to get angry, so I have to keep everybody happy. Eloheinu Moshienu, and Nachtemodim Lahad, which will call a brochot, or not to Kabali Mimha, Anna Adonai Tishpoch Rochecha Aleno, the Bechazdecha Abba, Tiftaket in Amshelano, the Teret Shalvrecha. Kenanu Abba, who mother her merits, low rack this moa, our gun can la assault the feed my shaker to bed vrecha. The Shem Yeshua Hamashiach, Adonenu, Goalenu, Vetsid Katino. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all of your blessings, your goodness, your mercy, and kindness. We thank you for your word, Lord God. We ask you now by your spirit to speak to us through your word, opening our eyes to its meaning and its glory. And more than this, Father, as always, we ask you for the wisdom and courage to be not only hearers of your word, but do us also. We ask us believing in the name of the one who saved us, the Lord Jesus, our Messiah, and our righteousness. In his name we pray. Amen. Are there any signs? I assure you I did not choose this topic. It was selected for me by my friend and nemesis, Dr. David Hawking. <laughs> I'm the hitman for the mob, and when he wants a hired gun, he brings me in. I live in England, so by the time the lynch mob shows up, I'll be on an airplane back across the Atlantic, and nobody local has to take the heat. I assure you I do not like controversial topics, uh, but sometimes they seem to like me. I run orphanages, for, well, our ministry runs orphanages for AIDS children in Africa. We plant churches, we evangelize Jews and people of other faiths. We plant churches, we do a lot of things. I get no particular kicks out of dealing with controversy. Nonetheless, we're still left with what the Word of God tells us. Are there any signs? I was first saved out of the Jesus movement, the hippie thing, in the early 1970s, at the end of the hippie era. And if you asked me then, 35 years ago, why I believed it was the last days, I would pretty much give you the standard list. Events in the Middle East, destruction of the environment, globalization of the world economy, the countries in the Roman Empire reconfederating into a non-democratic Europe, the ecumenical movement. I would have given you a pretty standard list of why I believe it was the last days 35 years ago. Now, I still believe all those things. In fact, if anything, I believe them more fervently now. I'm more convinced that those things point to the return of Christ now than I was when I was first saved. But none of those things, none of those things are the thing that convinces me the most that Jesus is coming soon. Frame, please. Slide. The Olivet Discourse, Jesus, Luke 21, Matthew 24 and 25, and Mark 13. Jesus gives us his basic outline of what to look for. Slide, please. He speaks of wars and rumors of wars one time. He speaks of an increase in famines one time. He speaks of an increased seismic activity, earthquakes one time, increased pestilence one time. In Luke 21, he speaks of the Jewish return to Jerusalem. One time. Nation against nation in Greek would be ethnon against ethnon, referring back to Isaiah. Nation arise against nation, increased racial conflict. One time. Astral phenomena. One time. Betrayal by brethren or false brethren. One time. One time, one time, one time, one time. He speaks of all those things one time. Slide. But he speaks about deception perpetrated against us four times. In the Olivet Discourse, they ask him, what's the sign of your coming, the end of the age? The first words out of Jesus' mouth, let no one deceive you. Let no one deceive us. The fact is, Jesus warned about deception perpetrated against Christians, saved Christians, the elect, us, four times more than he warned about anything else. And when you follow that through the epistles and back to the Hebrew prophets, you'll find that the Hebrew prophets and the apostles likewise warned about deception in the last days perpetrated against God's people more than any other single theme. This is not to deny the prophetic significance of events in the Middle East, Europe, by no means. But the fact that those things are happening concurrently with the apostasy in the church. Denominations that began as evangelical, that began as biblical, 
going in not only to theological liberalism, but everything from the ordination of homosexuals to same-sex marriages. Open apostasy. Into faith, Jesus is no longer the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes by him. That's sacrificed on the altar of political correctness and multi-ethnicism. Apostasy in the church, the deception perpetrated against us, is the overwhelming sign of the last days. False teachers with false doctrine. False prophets, people who predict things in the Lord's name that are time-specific that fail to happen. False messiahs. Now, technically speaking, the only thing a false messiah or a false Christ is is someone with a false anointing. But there's more to it than that. And of course, Nisim v'niflaot, signs and wonders. False signs and wonders. These are the four things Jesus focused on. Slide, please. At the same time, as we get closer to his return, there are more and more lies, which I have no doubt originate in the pit of hell, aimed at getting us to ignore the signs Jesus gave us. Satan does not want us to recognize the signs of the return of Christ. He does not want us to be ready. He does not want the believing church to pave the way or prepare the way for the return of Christ. One of these is exclusive preterism. People who say the events of 70 AD prophesied by Daniel and by Jesus were the last days, the book of Revelation and the Olivet Discourse have no future meaning. Now, in fact, there was a partial fulfillment of these things in 70 AD, that's true, but only partial. Not in their entirety. What happened in 70 AD prefigures, foreshadows what is to happen. We have to understand the way Jesus used preterism. He did not use it in the way people use it today. He said, no, he said watch out for the sign of Daniel, Daniel the prophet. When you see the shikut sameshomem, Babel, uh, the Aramaic term for abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel. Well, that had already happened with the Maccabees 160 years earlier. But he says what happened already is only a shadow of what will take place at the end. One is a shadow of the other. The events of 70 AD are a mere shadow, but we have people today saying these things have no future meaning. Even as we speak, I'm not here to attack anybody but the devil. I'm only stating facts. Please do not be offended. I'm trying to speak the truth in love. You have major leaders telling people these things have no future meaning. You have people saying these events, preterism, they're all fulfilled then. Well, I have to ask the question. Did Jesus separate the sheep from goats in 70 AD? Did Jesus give people their eternal reward based on what they did with their gifts in 70 AD? More than that, Jesus stated directly in Matthew 24. He said, no time like this has ever happened and nothing as bad will happen again. The simple fact is, far worse things have happened both to the Jews and to the church since 70 AD. Bar Kokhba's rebellion in the second century killed a lot more Jews than the events of 70 AD and got them driven out of their land for nearly 2,000 years. Far worse things have happened to the church. Worse things have happened both to Israel and the Jews and the church since 70 AD. There could not possibly, rationally, by any historical or biblical barometer, be a total fulfillment of the Olivet Discourse in 70 AD, yet that is what is being propagated today. Even as we speak, there are people who you may listen to on the radio, watch on television, you may read the books of people like Hank Canegraaff. They are propagating this erroneous idea. It is a deception. These things were not totally fulfilled in 70 AD. It is the devil who does not want us to understand what is really happening in our world. Rejection of the rapture, that's already been addressed by Dr. Ice. But 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 to 18, we have two words for rapture. One was named harpezo, the other is episunagage, our gathering together. The dead in Christ rise first and those who are raptured meet them in the air. This is a plain and direct biblical teaching. Daniel chapter 12 tells us those whose name is written in the book of life will be rescued. There is a coming rescue. Now, if you don't believe there is a rapture, you won't worry about being raptured. (laughs) 
Yet people will listen to people who predicted things that have not happened. Again, I'm only stating facts and I can document every fact. There was a book called The Harvest written by Rick Joyner. He predicted the triumph of communism throughout most of the world. Six months later, the Berlin Wall came down. The diametric opposite happened of what he said would happen, but he said the rapture is a fantasy and a myth. Some of these people even say the rapture is of the devil. The Kansas City Fellowship, Mike Bickle says the rapture of Elijah was a judgment on Elijah. In England, Gerald Coates, a devotee of these men, says the rapture is again a fantasy and a myth. The rapture is not a fantasy and a myth. Kingdom now theology is a fantasy and a myth. Dominionism is a fantasy and a myth. Hyper-Calvinistic reconstructionism is a fantasy and a myth. But the rapture is not a fantasy or a myth. But the God of this world would like us to believe it is. Back to the frame, please. Replacement theology. I do not say this because my family are Israelis or because my son is in the Israeli army. It's not something you take any joy in, believe me. Having said that, if God is not obligated to keep his covenant promises to Israel and the Jews, why should he have to keep them to the church? God never made a covenant with the church. The church has no covenant. Jeremiah 31, 31. I will make, literally, I will cut a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the one I made with their fathers. Jeremiah 31, 31 is where the New Testament is predicted. It's prophetically predicted it will be made not with the church, not with the Vatican, not with the Baptist, not with the World Council of Churches. It will be made with the Jews. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 9, to the Jews belongs, present continuous active in Greek, the covenants, plural, the ethike. Both covenants belong to the Jews. In other words, if God is finished with the Jews, he is automatically finished with the church because he never made a covenant with the church. If a tree is growing in the ground and its root is dead, Riza in Greek, you know the tree is not alive either. The church is dead if Israel is. The validity of a covenant never depends on the unfaithfulness of man, only on the faithfulness of God. It is his fidelity. But let's understand this. Well, even without resorting to the book of Revelation, Jesus himself stated three times, once in the Old Testament, twice in the New, that the Jews must be in Jerusalem for him to return. The first place is in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. The burden of the Lord concerning Jerusalem, they will look upon me who they have pierced and mourn as one mourns for an only son. The only way you can make sense of that prophecy is to take it literally and examine it in light of the New Testament. Jesus said directly in Matthew 23, for him to come back, the Jews must be in Jerusalem and say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And in Luke 21, 24, using the Greek words pletheron and ethnon, Jesus said directly, Jerusalem will be trampled down by the feet of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is completed. Jesus stated it three times literally and clearly. How many times must Jesus say something before people believe it? Can we go back, please? Exclusive preterism, rapture rejection, and replacement theology are three of the big lies today, but that's only the cartoon before the movie. You understand what's happening? The devil does not want us to anticipate the return of Christ. Next slide, please. We have the apostolic warnings. Let's begin with Peter. Turn with me, please, to First Peter. I'm sorry, it's Second Peter, chapter two, verse one. False prophets arose among the people, as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies even denying the master who bought them, bringing a swift destruction on themselves. That word there, parasogzusin, they put truth next to error. Truth next to error. Para is the Greek prefix meaning next to, like in paramedic, paralegal, paramilitary, something like that. Parasogzusin, they put truth next to error. One of the lies you hear today is, well, there's some truth in it, Well, no revival came from Toronto, Canada, or Pensacola, Florida. The, the, the fruit of the Spirit is self-control, not the lack of it. Ekrete in Greek. 
Now I'm a Pentecostal, don't get me wrong, I'm a raving Pente, but that's not Pentecost, that stuff was nuts. <laughs> well, there was some truth in it. God would not allow the Hebrews to make a garment of wool and flax. He hates the mixture. If you've been to Turkey, you perhaps visited Laodicea. The hot springs come down from Pamukla through the Roman aqueduct into the springs around Laodicea. You've got the cold water, the hot water, but with the two mix, you have lukewarm, a mixture of hot and cold. What does Jesus do with the mixture? God hates the mixture. When the Jehovah's Witnesses knock on the door, they're going to tell you a lot of true things. So will the Mormons. Always real cheese in a rat trap. <laughs> There's some truth in it. Of course there's some truth in it. Enough truth to masquerade the lie, the deception. Parasogzusin. They put truth next to error. Who? False teachers and false prophets. But look what Peter does. He uses the two interchangeably as if they were synonymous. False teachers among you, as there were false prophets among them. Why does Peter use false teachers and false prophets as if they were synonyms? Quite simply, if someone's doctrine is wrong, their predictions made in God's name will be wrong. If someone is teaching erroneous doctrine, their prophetic predictions made in God's name will not come true. Again, I can prove, I can prove every word. I'm not here to throw mud, but I am stating facts. Rick Joyner, Benny Hinn, Cindy Jacobs, I can give you a list, six feet long, of major figures who've made major public pronouncements of time-specific prophecies that have not happened. Now, God is no respecter of persons. We're told three times in Proverbs, an unjust balance is an abomination to the Lord. That very same thing makes Jehovah's Witnesses false prophets. It makes Mormons false prophets. It makes... Hasidic Jews, false prophets. It certainly makes the people Peter warns us about false prophets. You predict something in God's name that doesn't happen, that is time specific. Read Deuteronomy 18, read Jeremiah 28, read 2 Peter. That is false prophecy. I can prove every word. Peter goes on and he says of these people, Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be maligned. In their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Pseudo logos. Jesus is the true logos. And not a kaiho logos. In the beginning was the word. But there's a pseudo logos. In other words, a false Bible. Why are people reading the message? It is not dynamically equivalent. It is a paraphrase. To anyone who can read Greek or Hebrew, I can prove it is a paraphrase. It is not a matter of translation. It's a matter of the interpretation of the person who put it together. You want a mitzvah? Put a match to it. Get yourself a real Bible. A pseudologos. The Jehovah's Witnesses were masters at this. They did some incredible things. Considering most of them are uneducated people, they must be incredible. They invented an, an indefinite article in Greek. The word was a god, not there in the Greek. They invented the future in perfect tense, and they tran mistranslate the word stardavos as torture stake. Now, considering they don't know Greek to begin with, I don't know how they came up with the translation. They must be absolutely marvelous scholars. Leave the insanity to them. It's a pseudo-logos. But in their greed, they will exploit you. The people who put truth next to error and begin hyping you up, and they have to go to paraphrases because there's no responsible exegesis to come from the original Greek or Hebrew to substantiate what they're teaching you. There's a financial motive. These money preachers have made born again a household joke. They've prostituted the word of God so unsaved people think getting saved is a con job. 
if by the unmerited grace of God I was not already born again and I saw these money preachers on TV, I wouldn't want to be born again. I would think it was a con. They do more harm than good. Believe me, we'd be better off with no Christian TV than 90% of the rubbish we have today. Back to the frame, please. Second Peter, same chapter, verses 6 and 7. He speaks of Sodom and Gomorrah. In this city of San Diego, hereabout, in 2004 was the National Pastors Conference. I'm only stating facts. Published, public domain. The keynote speakers were Rick Warren, followed by Brian McLaren, the guru of the emergent church. Brian McLaren has called for the church to declare a five-year moratorium on the issue of homosexual ordination, same-sex marriage, and the like. And he said, after a five-year moratorium, we, that is the church, should decide after a five-year moratorium. Who gave the church the authority to decide something God has already decided? If God has already said it is Adam and Eve, how can the church say it's Adam and Steve? <laughs> but you understand what they're saying. We should decide. Now you have people claiming to be evangelicals saying something that liberal higher critics used to say. The church wrote the Bible, the church can rewrite it. Now you've got people in so-called evangelical circles saying the same thing. This issue of same-sex marriage and its homosexual ordination is being compromised increasingly. And it will get worse. And if possible, they will lobby politically to get the force of law on their side. A time will come when they will say, I'm sorry, you will deny someone a position as your pastor because they're a homosexual or a lesbian? That's sexual discrimination. You no longer are a tax-exempt charity. Your building is now taxable. Don't think that won't come. But when you have evangelicals saying, the church should decide it, when the church is not being salt and light, that's what these emergent church people are teaching. That happened at a conference here. He spoke in this city in 2004. After Mr. Warren and Mr. McLaren, the next session after lunch was yoga. Now, I go to India, and we have many Christians say that of Hinduism in England, where I live. Ask them what yoga is. It is in no sense compatible with biblical Christianity. It is what Isaiah warned about. My people are filled with influences from the East. This is the third time Eastern mysticism has invaded Western Christendom. The first time was with the post-Nicene fathers in Alexandria, people like Oregon and Basilides and Valentinus. That was the first time with the, with the, with the post-Nicene patristic writers, the church fathers. The second time was when the Crusades on the spice trades to India were bringing back the influences of Hinduism and mystical Islam to Europe. The counting the prayer on beads, the bowing down to the images, that was the second time Eastern religion invaded the Western church. This is the third time. We call it the emergent church. It is simply new age, married to postmodernism, trying to call itself Christian. Chuck Smith was right. Let's look. But then Peter tells us there will be this tremendous falling away in this chapter in verses 17 to 22. People we thought were Christians who claimed to be brethren will go into this stuff. They will follow the false teachers, the false prophets. They'll compromise on moral issues. They'll go with the money preachers. And then they will fall away and turn against the rest of us. As we speak, the stage is being set for this to happen. In fact, being perfectly honest, to a degree, it is already underway. Next slide. We have John warning of Antichrist in 1 John chapter 2, verse 18 to 23, but John defines Antichrist here as a denial of the father-son relationship. You deny that Jesus is the eternal Son of God, that is a doctrine of Antichrist. It is Antichrist. The Quran says, Allah is not begotten, neither does he beget. God has no son. One of the emergent leaders in England is a person called Steve Chalk, a Baptist. He write a, wrote a book, and he's supported by someone called Colin Chapman, another so-called evangelical. These are people who say they're born again, you understand. Hindus can be saved because there's truth in Hinduism. They can be born again. 
Muslims can be saved because there's truth in the Koran. These people can be born again and saved by Jesus without knowing Jesus and not confessing Jesus. I have a picture on our website, you can see of the Pope kissing the Koran, a book that says God has no son. I'm only stating facts. Well, that's what they say. The Apostle John said, this is Antichrist. The eternal sonship of Jesus as God incarnate and as the eternal Son of God is a non-negotiable. Yet it's being negotiated. Next frame, please. But then we have the Pauline warnings. Paul's warnings are many scriptures. One of the most important are 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 13, an incredible chapter. And he describes what the last days are going to be like by warning what people are going to be like. Only it's not just the world, it's the church. Realize this, in the last days, difficult times will come. Men will be lovers of self. That is what psychology is, the religion of man. We have the psychologization of the church. There is less and less exposition of God's word, more and more motivational speaking using pop jargon, stories, anecdotes. This is psychology. It's the whole Joel Austin trip. It is not biblical Christianity. It is psychology. Men will be lovers of self. Consumerism. What church is going to meet your needs? Agape love always puts God first, others second, and ourselves last. Wrong question. Not what church is going to meet my needs. Not what church is going to meet your needs. In what church is God going to use you to meet the needs of others? Men will be lovers of self. Lovers of money. Yes, friends, I want each and every one of you to open up your heart and open up your wallet and show me how much you love the Lord Jesus. Can you say amen? <laughs> the whole Benny and Kenny trip. The Sister Joyce earring fund. Do you know what unsaved people think when they see this? Do you know what the world thinks when they see this? It gives me no pleasure to discuss these matters. But these are signs of the end. And then it goes on. Of money. But when we get to the same chapter, verse 5, holding to the form of religion, but denying the power therein. Liberal theology, higher criticism, and the emergent church. The emergent church guru in his book, A Generous Orthodoxy, again, Mr. McLaren writes, I'm only quoting him, Christianity is not based on propositional truth and never was. A propositional truth, philosophically, is a simple true or false statement. Now, Paul tells us, if it is not a propositional truth that Christ is risen, if the historicity of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not an objective fact, we are the most foolish of all men. You shouldn't be here today, you shouldn't be here Sunday if Christ is not risen, if that's not an objective, propositional fact. You should be down at a saloon or a discotheque, getting stoned, getting drunk, fornicating, carrying on like the world, go to Vegas for the weekend, anything, but don't come to church. You're foolish for coming here. You're foolish for not being like the world, if Christ is not risen. Biblically, Christianity depends on objective, propositional truth. This is being denied. This is postmodernism. It is not Christianity. It is the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age. Holding the form of religion, but denying the power therein. They'll meditate, talk about relationships, have contemplative prayer, have anything but the truth of God's word. Christ is indeed risen. That's a fact. But then we have verse 6. Oh, sorry, verse 8, Jonas and Jambres, Pharaoh's magicians. Oh boy, do these guys know how to put on a show. Biblically, we call them in Hebrew, Nassim Vaniflaot, signs and wonders. These signs follow. Jesus never allowed signs, wonders, miracles, or healings to be the focus of his message or his ministry. The only thing he had to do in Luke chapter 23 was put on a show for Herod and they wouldn't have crucified him. But he wasn't about that. These signs follow. Signs and wonders are not the key to belief. Jesus said, for which of these signs do you seek to stone me in John 10? 
It was John Wimber who said they're the key to make people believe. Jesus said the opposite. Again, I'm only stating facts. Jesus said, now again, I'm a Pentecostal. Jesus said, a wicked and an adulterous generation seeks a sign. You see people flocking to stadiums and arenas for this. You see people flocking to arenas and stadiums for this. That is a wicked and an adulterous generation seeking a sign. The Antichrist and false prophet are going to put on one incredible show. We are warned of this. Back to the frame, please. This is not charismata, it is charismania. But then Paul tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, look what he says in verse 12. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. You don't have to suffer, you're a king's kid. Come with me to Indonesia next month, I'll show you Christians who are terribly persecuted. And their churches are growing so fast you wouldn't believe it. I live in England where they're closing churches left and right and turning them into mosques. Europe is post-Christian and neo-pagan. America is going the same way, post-Christian, neo-pagan. But where the church is persecuted, like in the Far East where I go to, I'm watching the body of Christ beat the trousers off of Islam. Indonesia, the government admits a 7 to 7.5% 7 Christian population. Everybody knows it's nearly 25%, despite 300,000 Christians being butchered alive in East Timor despite 30,000 Christians being killed in the Moluccan Islands, despite 3,000 churches being burned to the ground in the last three years, Malaysia has gone down to a 56% Muslim population, in large part due to the growth of the true church. You don't have to suffer, you're a king's kid. Well, if you're not willing to suffer, you're not a king's kid. Verse 13, evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You would think after the scandals of, 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 of Jim Baker and Swaggart and all these things, that the church would have repented. But instead they proceed from bad to worse. Deceiving and being deceived. These people are deceived themselves. They actually believe these lies. God gives them over to it. They built their empire on it. Their empire. That's all they're building or the empires of men. They're not building the kingdom of Jesus. Next frame, please. Then we have ecumenism. I'd like to ask this question. I ask this question quite frequently. Now, my own family is a mixture of Catholic and Jewish. I went to a Catholic school and a Jewish community center. If you must know, I was both sprinkled and clipped. I love Jewish people, and I love Catholic people, but because I love them, I want them to be saved. How many people here, please put your hand up and keep it just for a moment. How many people here used to be Roman Catholic? Put your hand up. Look around. With respect, do not ask Chuck Colson what Catholicism is. Ask somebody saved out of it. Does the blood of Christ cleanse from all sin, or do you atone in purgatory for your own? Is there one mediator between God and man, or is there another? Is a human being infallible, or is only God? You cannot believe the doctrines of Rome and the doctrines of the New Testament. The reformers were not perfect men. The reformers made a lot of mistakes. Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, they all made mistakes. But every one of them was from the intelligentsia of the Roman Catholic clergy. They were Roman Catholic priests who went back and read the Greek and in some places Hebrew. And they realized the word metanoia does not mean confession, penance, it meant to repent. His blood cleanses from all sin. You do not atone in purgatory for your own. Back to the frame, please. We're told in Hebrews 7, 25, Christ dies once. Hebrews 9, 25, he dies once. Hebrews 10, 12, he dies once. Hebrews 10, 14, he dies once. 1 Peter 3, 18, he dies once. He's perfected for all time, those who are being sanctified. If something is perfected, you cannot by definition improve upon it. 
The Mass says he continues to die again sacramentally, time and time again. The elements are transubstantiated, and then you consume it physically. The apostles condemned the consumption of blood in Acts 15, didn't they? In John 6, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, if it means what they think, which it doesn't in the context, why in four verses later did Jesus say the flesh profits nothing? <laughs> We're saved by grace through faith. He justifies us. We're saved by the new birth. We're not saved by rituals or sacraments or purgatory. We're saved by the blood of Jesus. Well, understand this. Next point. You've got necromancy, praying to the dead. Ritual consumption of blood. Another intermediary. God says he will not give his glory to another. Human infallibility. But Jesus warned of the last days, if they say he's in the inner rooms or he's in the desert, don't go there. When you say the return of Christ physically and literally takes place in bread and wine, that he's come back to earth physically, you either believe that or you believe him. That is not how he returns. Now understand, the present Pope John Paul II, the issue was not that he fought for Hitler in his youth as a Nazi wearing the swat sticker. Neither is the issue that he issued the Criminali Solicitationis document that instructed Roman Catholic bishops and cardinals, including Mahoney, to protect pedophile nuns and priests at the expense of not protecting the children whose lives they destroy. How many Roman Catholic dioceses in the United States? 179. How many bishops and cardinals and archbishops were caught protecting pedophiles, sued in court for libel? 179. It was broadcast on the BBC, Political Pressure Cape it off TV in America. I've got a copy of it in Latin and English, and I read Latin very well. There is something wrong here, dear friends. But if you get in bed with the Pope, he's in bed with the Dalai Lama. He called the Dalai Lama, his predecessor, John Paul II, the great spiritual leader. I saw the Dalai Lama on television in South Africa once, and he said, we don't believe there's a creator. We're not like Christians and Jews. But we can still be one with Christians by closing our eyes and meditating about things like peace. But although the Dalai Lama says there's no God, he allows himself to be worshipped as a reincarnation of the Buddha. You get in bed with the pontiff, he is in bed with the Dalai Lama. He kisses the Koran. It is a step to what? It's not ecumenism, it's interfaith. Next frame, please. Monogenes, Jesus is the only begotten of the Father. The Greek term, monogenes. The word of the Church of Jesus Christ, the Latter day Saints. I've got a burning in my bosom and I testify to you, the Church of Latter day Saints is true. <laughs> Their Jesus Christ is the half brother of Satan. The half brother of Satan. And the Mormons have a prophecy that the last president of the United States is going to be a Mormon. Back to the frame, please. We have pulpit politics, left and right. Jesus would not get dragged into political issues. He never tried to identify the gospel with a political party or ideology. But it's happened in this country, on the left and on the right. In the state of Illinois, in the legislature, the man who led the crusade for partial birth abortion is Barack Obama, Senator. Partial birth abortion is a late-term abortion where you do a forcible extraction of the fetus through the birth canal with a pair of forceps. Then when it's in the process of being dragged out of his mother, you do a suboccipital puncture, you insert a suction catheter, and use this vacuum cleaner to suck its brains out. Twice, twice, Congress vetoed it. Uh, outlawed it. Twice, President Clinton vetoed it. Yet when President Clinton appeared in, I'm only stating facts, he appeared at Bill Hybels Church in Chicago in front of over 5,000 evangelical pastors. Not one question. Why did you veto the congressional ban on partial birth abortions, Mr. Clinton? Hybels wouldn't allow that, I guess. Hybels did allow a Muslim to preach in his church, so did Mr. Schuler. Please find the mosque that'll let me explain Christianity to Muslims. <laughs> 
But then we go back to eight weeks ago, eight weeks, dear friends, eight weeks. What would you call a man who led a crusade to legalize partial birth abortion? Would you call him a benevolent liberal? Well, Rick Warren did eight weeks ago. He had Senator Obama standing in his pulpit, the man who led the crusade for partial birth abortion, one hour drive from where you were seated, calling it a compassionate liberal. If dragging a baby out of its mother with a pair of pliers and sucking its brains out after you drill a hole in its head is compassion, I want to know what happens when he gets angry. That's the left, but what about the right? We've ordered God out of the classroom a long time ago, now he's been ordered out of the courts. Who wrote the Supreme Court decision ordering the Ten Commandments out of the Judicial Building in Alabama? It was Sandra Day O'Connor, a Reagan Republican appointed by Ronald Reagan. Of the three presidential candidates you have now, Mr. Romney, the Mormon, endorsed by Pat Robinson, he's going to address Pat Robinson's seminary for the commencement. A man who says Jesus is the half-brother of Satan will be giving the commencement address. Then you have Mr. McCain from Arizona, and you have Mr. Giuliani from my own New York. All three of these Republicans have a pro-abortion history. On what basis can Christians try to identify politically with any of this? Jesus did not do it. Now, indeed, we need to pray for whoever gets elected. But I'll tell you something about whoever gets elected. I've said this before. They're like the heirs to the throne of Solomon, Jeroboam and Rehoboam. Which bum do you want? Let us continue. Back to the frame, please. Back, previous one. Hyper-Calvinism. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. Look at it, please. God who desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Does that sound like a God who creates people to go to hell? There has been a growth of hyper-Calvinism in the last six, seven years. People turned off by hyper-charismatic extremism and extreme Pentecostalism are going to these cessationist Calvinists of the extreme reformed camp. People who believe in covenant theology, who believe in replacement theology, but who believe God created people to go to hell. That is not the God of the Bible. Can you imagine the Taliban, what they did, they banned all culture. Instead of sports or music, we'll have public flogging and we'll have decapitation. We'll have public execution. That will be how we'll entertain the people. Women are oppressed. I have to wear all, everything covered. They, religious police can come into your house. Read what the Taliban did in Afghanistan. Then read about John Calvin's Geneva. Believe me, there's not a lot of difference. In fact, there's no difference at all. Islam teaches inja Allah, everything that happens is God's will. <laughs> so does hyper-Calvinism. But the Bible says he desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Hell was not made for people. Jesus said it was made for Satan and his angels. God became a man and was nailed to a cross so I wouldn't have to go there. Let us continue. Next frame, please. But one of the things Paul wants about the most is a page out of the book of Jeremiah. When men say peace and security, then the end will come. A quest for peace at a perilous time at the end of the age. Everything will be peace, peace. Just like Jeremiah, they say peace, peace, but there is no peace. The Bible says something different though. In the book of Revelation chapter 6 verse 4, take peace from the earth. And in Matthew chapter 10, verse 34, Jesus said, I came not to bring peace. Now we have to understand the nature of this. What is happening as we speak? Next frame, please. God has a peace plan. His peace plan is based on evangelism and discipleship. How lovely on the mountain are the feet of him who brings good news, the gospel of peace. Ephesians 6.15, Isaiah 52.7, Colossians 1.20. The key to peace is seeing people get saved and then the return of Christ. That is God's peace plan. Next frame, please. We have two concepts of peace in the Bible. We have the Greek concept, Irene, we get the girl's name Irene, meaning an absence of conflict. In London, England, where I live, 
sardonically in the 18th century in his dictionary, Dr. Samuel Johnson defined peace as a period of preparation and deception between two wars. <laughs> that's the world's peace. But Rabbi Yeshua Bar Yosef said, that's Jesus. Shlomi ani atten lahem lo olam. My peace I give you, not like the world gives you. He gave shalom. Shalom comes from the Hebrew word shilum, filled, complete. It's from the infinitive of the Hebrew verb leshalem, leshalem. Shalom comes from leshalem, to pay, to fulfill, to fill. We have shalom because Jesus the Messiah came to pay the price for our sin, to fulfill the law of Moses that no Jew and no man could ever keep and to fill us with his spirit. We have shalom because the Messiah came to Les Shalem. You can be in the biggest conflict of your life and have shalom. <laughs> and you can be in a pristine circumstance and lack it. Shalom is nothing to do with Irene, necessarily. Now ultimately, it will include that. God's shalom will ultimately include the absence of conflict. The nations will indeed beat their spears into pruning hooks when Christ returns. It will ultimately include the absence of conflict. But there's no irene in this world before Jesus returns. But there is shalom. When people are born again, when they repent of their sins and accept Christ, evangelism is God's key to peace. That's God's peace plan. But something has overtaken the church as we speak. The church's peace plan, next frame please, I'm only quoting him. This is Mr. Warren's peace plan. Again, I'm not attacking him, I'm quoting him. This is on his website, it's in his book. P, planting churches, it's an acronym. E, equip leaders. A, assist the poor. C, care for the sick. And E, education. Do you see any evangelism in that? I don't. Now that's not to say we shouldn't plant churches, equip leaders, assist the poor, care for the sick, or educate people. I run orphanages for AIDS babies in Africa with our team. But that's not going to bring peace. What you have is a social gospel and a political gospel. He had Mr. Obama in his pulpit. After Hundreds and hundreds of Katusha rockets were fired at Israel, one of them destroying the home of my friend's son, one of our missionaries, one of them almost killing my own son on the beach in Haifa, one of them shelling his base. Mr. Warren went to Syria and sang the praises of a regime in Syria that's aligned with Iran. Do you know what those people did in backing Hezbollah? Do you know what happened to the Christian population of southern Lebanon? Genocidal extermination is what they faced. Yet he goes over there and sings the praises of this regime. He did it. When he was criticized, he came back in December and gave an interview in Christianity Today magazine where he said those who didn't like what he did are more interested in politics than they are the gospel. He didn't preach the gospel to those Muslims. He talked about politics himself. I want Muslims to be saved. I've led Muslims to Christ. You're not going to find a better believer on the face of the earth than somebody truly saved out of Islam, I'll tell you that. But that's the only way to see peace come to the Muslim world. That's his peace plan. It's what he says. I am not doing anything but stating facts. Next, please. So what do you do when you have your own peace plan that doesn't include evangelism, that varies from the Bible. How do you deal with scripture? You need a new hermeneutic, a new way to interpret God's word. It's called mutilation. Highlight and delete, cut and paste. This is exactly what this man has done. I'm only stating the facts. There is a reason Chuck Smith has been warning about this stuff. Chuck Smith is right. There's a reason Roger Oakland is warning about this stuff. Roger Oakland is right. There's a reason Dave Hunt is warning about this stuff. Dave Hunt is right because this is right. This stuff is nuts. Pay attention. 
When they asked him about the last days, he said, avoid the subject of end time prophecy. It's a diversion. He said, when they asked Jesus, what will be the sign of the end and your return? Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times or seasons. The Father has sticks by his own authority, but you shall receive dunamis, power in Greek. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Sounds biblical. Only turn with me to Acts chapter 1 where Jesus is quoted. Verse 6. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is that at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? They didn't ask him about the last days. They were asking him when the millennium will begin. They were Jews who were saying, we know you're the Messiah, we know you're the suffering servant, we know you are what we call in Hebrew Hamashiach ben Yosef. When are you going to be Hamashiach ben David? In other words, when are you going to fulfill the promises to King David? to restore the kingdom that was lost with the Babylonian captivity. When are you going to fulfill these other prophecies? For which the Jews would have to be back in their land and their capital. And Jesus says, it's not for you to know the times or the epics. The Father is fixed. That was the question. That was the answer. Turn to Matthew 24, verse 3. And he was sitting on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Highlight verse 3. Do a cut and paste. Go to Acts chapter 1, verse 6. Highlight verse 6 and delete it. Paste Matthew 24, verse 3, where Acts 1, 6 used to be. Lord, what will be the sign of your coming the end of the age? It's not for you to know. He changed the order of the verses. A Jehovah's Witness would not have the audacity to pull a stunt like that. A Mormon would not have the audacity to pull a stunt like that. And pastors, thousands and thousands of them say nothing? When they asked Jesus, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age, Jesus said, let no one deceive you. If people are swallowing this stuff, I'm not saying you're going to be deceived. You're going to be deceived. No, you are deceived. If you've gone down the ecumenical road, you're not going to be deceived. You're deceived already. If you're following the faith prosperity money preachers, you're not going to be deceived. You're deceived already. If you went to Toronto, Canada or Pensacola, Florida to act like a baboon, you're not going to be deceived. You're deceived already. If you believe in a global peace plan that is not biblical, you're believing the very thing we were told to look out for. When men say, peace and security, then the end will come. Mr. Warren, I hope you get a copy of this. I challenge you to a debate here in California, open to the public in front of a video camera, anytime, anyplace. <laughs> Not because I know Greek, or because I know Hebrew, but because people who believe your books don't seem to know anything. I'm not angry at anybody but the devil. But Jesus is coming, and he does not want us to be ready. Are there signs? Absolutely. These things in the Middle East are signs. These things happening in Europe, a non-democratic Europe, is a sign. Let us destroy those who are destroying the earth. It's a sign. Globalization of the world economy, that is a sign. But the biggest sign is you. The biggest sign is what happened at the National Pastors Conference here in San Diego, California in 2004. Mr. Warren, Mr. McLaren, and Yoga. The lie went out from San Diego. 
I pray to God that today the truth will. God bless you.